thank you very much. Um, I hope you all have a handout. Uh, you all, it may help to follow the course of the argument. Libertarian free will, by which I shall understand agent causal libertarian free will, is freedom to choose which intentional actions to perform without there being a sufficient prior cause, sufficient prior full cause, that is, of our making those choices. I argue in this paper that we do have some evidence from our own experience of making choices that we do have this kind of free will. Act, acting intentionally involves forming an intention in the light of desires and value beliefs, both of which are conscious states of which the agent is or can become aware. Beliefs and desires are also both passive states. At any particular time, one finds oneself desiring to do some action, and one finds oneself believing that the action is good or bad, as the case may be. We do not choose our desires or beliefs at any rate at a given time. When one has no value beliefs about which of two incompatible actions between which one has to choose would be the best to do, inevitably one does what one desires to do most, what one has the strongest desire to do, if there is a strongest desire. When one has no desires about which of two incompatible actions between which one has to choose, other than desires to do actions to the extent to which they are good to do, inevitably one does the action which one believes is the best, if there is such an action. Hence the need for choice. And so the possibility of free choice only arises when one is faced with, and they're on the handout, when one is faced with either two incompatible equally desired actions which one believes to be of equal value, or two, two incompatible actions, one of which one desires to do more and one of which one believes would be better to do. An agent is free, I suggest, if and only if he or she chooses freely in these situations. I'm going to assume the thesis of moral internalism. That is, that a belief that some action is good entails a desire to do that action. Um, one may have other desires not to do that action for different reasons, but if one believes that an action is good to do, one has some desire to do it, although maybe not a very strong one. And that is the thesis of moral internalism, which I'm going to assume. Henceforward, I will call an action which one believes not to be the best, a, a desire to do an action which one believes not to be de, the best, a bad desire, and the desire to do an action which one believes to be the best, a good desire. Actions, agents have to choose on which desire to act. I shall understand by the strength of a desire, a measure of how much the agent wants, how keen they are to have what they desire, how much they mind about not having it. Our beliefs influence our actions only by the desires which they cause. So by the strength of a good desire, I do not mean how confident the agent is that that value belief which caused it is true, nor do I mean how important they believe it to be that they should fulfill it. Of course, all these fat features of an agent's value belief affect the strength of his or her desire to act on that belief, but I emphasize by the strength of a desire, I mean how much they feel inclined to do it as a result of having the desire. We have libertarian free will, if and only if our actions are not fully determined by the relative strengths of our desires. So I'm arguing that our desires and beliefs are what form our actions, insofar as anything from outside forms our actions, and that our beliefs <laughs> affect things only insofar as they create our desires, and so it is the relative strength of our desires which alone influences us in our action choice, and we choose between them sometimes. The 
claim is often made that our psychological experience of choice in these situations where we choose between alternatives of the two kinds just describes, in that our psychological experience is that it seems to us that as we choose, no causes totally determine how we shall choose. It feels as if we are influenced by causes of the kind which I have described, but that no collection of causes taken together fully determine how we will choose. That is, that it's up to us. It seems to us that we have libertarian free will. However, it has often been disputed whether it does really seem to most people that they have libertarian free will and that the people who think that they do are over-influenced by various um, considerations around them in society and the popularity of various views about punishment. So it's worth uh, uh, having a serious psychological investigation as to whether it really does seem to humans in this situation on the whole that they do have libertarian free will. And um, to my mind, there's only been one such serious investigation done, and I mention what it is on the handout. It is the investigation by Deary and others in 2013, which is published in the first volume of Oxford Studies in uh, uh, Responsibility. Uh, these authors um, recruited a considerable number of participants online from a website who had no previous philosophical indoctrination, um, and they paid them a modest sum for this, and they did uh, separate studies involving 84 participants in one, 155 in the second, 160 in the third, and they began by giving the participants tests to determine whether they understood the crucial questions, which were in effect questions about whether it felt to them that they could have done other than they did. And the participants were then asked to make choices in different studies between imaginary alternatives and between actual alternatives, uh, some of which included giving a some small sum of money donated by the test organizers either to one charity or a different charity and so on. So it was a very thorough study. And the overall result was that in all of these studies, most of the participants reported their experiences as being those of people who had libertarian free will. Okay, well, let's suppose that is the common intuition. Now, I shall assume a basic principle of rationality, which I call the principle of credulity. It's had other names in the journals before. The principle that it's always rational to believe that things are as they seem to be, and strongly rational to believe things as they strongly seem to be, in the absence of counter-evidence. To say that it's rational to believe these things is to say that one is epistemically justified in believing them and that things are probably as they seem on the evidence that they do seem a certain way. If it seems to me that I or you are listening to a lecture, it's rational for you to believe that you are listening to a lecture. If it seems to me that I ate toast for breakfast this morning, that is that I apparently remember it, it's rational for me to believe it and so on, all this in the absence of counter-evidence. Without relying on what we seem to experience in the absence of counter-evidence, we could have few rational beliefs, few probably true beliefs at all. Given that principle of credulity, it would seem to follow that from the evidence collected by Deary and others that uh, it is probable that humans have libertarian free will in the absence of counter-evidence. But should we interpret the principle of credulity quite so generally? It is a natural reaction to such a general use of the principle to object, as many authors have done, all that that shows is that we are not aware of any other causes influencing us but to say that we are not aware of any other causes than our desires influencing us doesn't show that there aren't any other causes. Um, we can't infer from the absence of evidence that um, 
of evidence of other causes that there aren't any other causes. For example, Richard Holton, I think that's quoted on the handout, writes, experience of choice does provide evidence for the more modest judgments that agents might make that they could have acted differently given their prior beliefs, desires, and intentions, but it provides no support for the more radical judgment that the choices are not determined by anything. And various other authors have made that point. An objection of this kind would be a fair objection to a claim about some conscious event of a different kind, for example, a sensation or an occurrent thought. I can't have evidence merely from experience of a headache or the thought that maybe it's time for lunch, that the headache or thought is caused or uncaused. But, I suggest, intentions are different. We know that they are caused in part. We know that they are caused in part by our desires. An action wouldn't be an intentional action if one did not in any way desire the occurrence of the intended event, either because one found oneself just desiring or because one believed it good that the event should occur. In the absence of any desire for its occurrence, the event would simply be an unintended bodily mo movement. I have been suggesting that the desires are the only causes which influence us, and in the absence of that, they wouldn't have an intentional action. Now, these various authors would suggest that there may be some all sorts of independent causes of which we are unaware influencing us to do some action. If that was the case, if there was an independent cause influencing what, independent of it's producing the desires, but acting quite separately. If there was some independent cause influencing one to do some action, well, it would still one cause one to do the action, even if one did not have the relevant desire. And we have every reason to suppose that such a thing would not happen. Suppose that, faced with a choice between eating a cucumber sandwich and eating a piece of chocolate cake, I form the intention to eat the cake because I desire to do so, despite having a, a weaker desire caused by a belief that it would be better to choose the sandwich instead. Now, I know that I wouldn't have formed the intention to eat the cake unless I desired the cake. Without that desire, I would have been guided by the good desire and ate the cake. But if there had been some other cause unknown to me influencing me to eat the cake, then, I might still have eaten the cake, even if I did not in any way desire to do so. And I can be very confident that without that desire, my hand would certainly not have taken the cake and put it in my mouth. And if, totally improbably, I had lost control of my hand and that happened, then eating the cake would not have been an intentional action and would not have been formed by an intention. And if in this situation I had resisted the desire to eat the cake under the influence of my good desire, I know that I would not have resisted the desire to eat the cake without having the good desire produced by a value belief. An intention wouldn't be an intentional action and so have been formed by an intention if its causes bypassed one's desires. And so, to quote another uh, competitive author, uh, Tim Bain, all that he says, there is an extensive body of research in cognitive science detailing a myriad of ways in which our actions and decisions are influenced by factors of which we are not conscious. And he sees this as perhaps the strongest objection to an argument from experience for free will. But my point is that although all sorts of unknown factors may indeed influence us, they influence us by influencing our desires. The unknown factor makes us desire to do this more or desire to do that less. Of course, that is true. But they don't act independently uh, because if they did, then they would take over even if we didn't have desires. And then you wouldn't have an intentional action. So, I, I've argued the only things that uh, influence our actions are our desires. And the issue is whether they just, uh, influence them totally 
or whether we have a choice between which desire to act on. And, of course, uh, reason suggests to us that uh, uh, if our good desire is the strongest desire, we don't need to do anything, we just let it go. But the serious choice arises when uh, our strongest desire is to do the bad action. Uh, and, uh, alternatively, the choice arises when we have two actions of equal value. So the issue is, uh, can, do we have a choice when uh, in these situations? Um, now, we cannot measure how do we measure the strength of our desire in order to assess whether or not uh, we have this sort of choice. Well, we cannot measure the absolute strength of conscious events, such as desires become when we are conscious of them. Just because they are conscious events, we cannot put a publicly accessible ruler along them or stick a thermometer on, in them. All one can do by measuring the strength about, all one can do by way of measuring the strength of a desire is to measure it relative to the strength of other desires and to discover that it's greater or much greater or the same as or less than or much less than those other desires. But given my definitions, I suggest that one is often in a position to judge that one is subject to conflicting desires of equal strength. Um, that's the way it seems to me, therefore that's evidence that the way it is. I can be reasonably confident that I desire the ice cream as much as I desire the chocolate cake. Then, if I have no relevant value beliefs, something has got to determine which action I eventually take. And for the reasons I have given, it cannot be some unknown cause which operates independently of my desires. It seems to me that it is I who determine it, in an arbitrary way, no doubt, not determined by my desires and beliefs. So, by the principle of credulity, I am justified in believing that that is so, and that I am the cause of this. Likewise, I suggest one is often in a position to judge that one is subject to conflicting good desires arising from valued beliefs of equal strength. And so the same applies. Something has to determine which happens, and it is I. Finally, what of the conflict between bad desire and good desire? In some of cases, of course, people do report that their bad desires were so strong that they were overwhelmed by them. And there's no reason why a libertarian should deny that sometimes this happens. A libertarian is not committed to the view that all actions are always free, only that quite often actions of the kind I have mentioned are free. Now, such is my initial stance. Now, an objector might uh, produce an objection based on uh, some version of the private language argument. That is to say, they might claim that there can't be any content to some judgment that one desire is stronger or weaker than another, uh, except by waiting to, to see, see which desire determines the subsequent action. He might claim there's no way of possible way of checking beforehand whether one desire is or is not stronger if the only way of checking is the way it seems to me that it is the case. Uh, that is what uh, Wittgenstein would have said, and many have followed in that line. If there's no way of checking it, then there's no truth there. I don't agree with that objection. I think we can be perfectly certain about uh, other matters of co our consciousness, uh, even though there's no way of checking. But in, I would do also now wish to suggest that in this circumstance there is a way of checking in some cases. Suppose, and this way consists in comparing the strength of our desires on a certain occasion with our memory of, their strength, of the strengths of similar desires on earlier occasions. Suppose that in applying for a certain job, I have a moral belief that I ought not to lie about my qualifications, but I desire to get the job. Suppose that I have applied for several jobs recently, and it seems to me that on these occasions my good desires not to lie resulting from my moral beliefs 
were of equal strength to my present good desire. I remember feeling on past occasions the influence of my belief that it's good not to lie about my qualifications just as strongly as I feel now. And suppose that it seems to me that on these past occasions my desires to get the job were no stronger and sometimes weaker than my desire to get the job this time. Unemployment has made me even keener get a, to get a job. But suppose that on all these past occasions I have lied about my qualifications. It then follows that if my memories, if my memories of the strength of my desires in the past are accurate, and on this new occasion I force myself to tell the truth, my action cannot be fully determined by my desires, for if it had been, there would have been the same outcome on this occasion as on the other occasions. So my resisting the temptation to lie on this occasion must depend on my uncaused choice, and conversely, if I go the other way in certain circumstances. And we can generalize this example to see the force of different kinds of apparent memories of the strength of our desires in the past relative to their present strengths. Now, of course, my memory beliefs about the strength of my desires on previous occasions, just like my beliefs about their strength on this particular occasion, may be in error. On any particular occasion, and just possibly on all occasions, things may not be as we seem to remember they were in this respect. Maybe we always overestimate or underestimate the strengths of certain kinds of desires. But what the principle of credulity claims is that in the, in the absence of counter-evidence, we should believe that things are as they seem to be. And my present point is that sometimes my belief that I myself make a difference to whether or not I lie can be confirmed by another belief about my conscious life, a belief that it seems to me one way today can be confirmed by belief about how it seemed to me that things were on previous occasions. Now, we do not always have relevant information of this kind about our previous choices, nor do many of us ever make the, this kind of comparison. But what the examples of this kind do show is that we can sometimes have confirming, sometimes have confirming or disconfirming evidence from our own conscious life for our initial basic beliefs that our desires are of certain strength. And this, in turn, suggests that we have an objective concept of one desire being stronger than another, since our judgments about this are on some occasions open to checking. Open to checking in the absence of counter-evidence. All these claims are in the absence of counter-evidence. And what I have argued so far is in the absence of counter-evidence, um, there is good evidence that sometimes we choose um, uh, despite the forces, that is the desires which operate on us. But what sort of counter-evidence can there be? Well, there can certainly be counter-evidence from neuroscience or from very large social science. And uh, some of the papers uh, in this conference discuss that, and I'm certain that I'm not going to discuss that. The only thing I'm concerned with is whether there can be any a priori counter-argument to, to all this. And um, uh, one previous paper has mentioned one or two such arguments, but I think the one most discussed in the literature, and which I find initially the most plausible, um, is the one by Peter van Inwagen, his rollback argument, his argument against his own position to which he cannot see any objection, um, um, with which uh, many of you will be familiar. Um, this argument purports to show that inevitably almost any evidence of any kind about human choices would be reasonably interpreted as showing that they are random choices. Now, uh, this argument runs as follows. Uh, Peter asks us to suppose that at some time T1, Alice has a choice of lying or telling the truth. She tells the truth, and let us suppose that her choice was not predetermined. 
uh, he, uh, Fiedler allows that uh, uh, choices might not be predetermined, but he wishes to show that in that case it's chance that is, that is doing the work, not us. Now, he says, suppose that God a thousand times caused the universe to revert to exactly the same state as it was at T1. What would have happened? We observers shall almost certainly observe the ratio of the outcome truth to the outcome lie, settling down or conferred, converging on some value. Let us imagine the simplest case. We observe that Alice tells the truth in almost about half the replays and lies in about almost half the replays. If after a hundred replays, Alice has told the truth 53 times, and has lied 48 times, is it not true that we shall become convinced that what will happen in the next replay is a matter of chance? And similarly, Van in Wagen claims that any other value on which the ratio of the outcome truth to the outcome lie converge would be evidence of a corresponding chance in each replay. So he suggests we've got it. <laughs> If it's really uh, not determined, then there must be some particular bias uh, in us, and this would show up in the ratio of good choices to bad choices, which we made. And um, they couldn't, he says, it's going to be inevitable that we would, or almost inevitable, that would uh, settle down to some figure, and so we would be able to fix the value of the bias, and that would show the chance involved. Now, of course, it's, there isn't any necessity that any series of heads or ta heads tails or good choices, bad choices will uh, converge on any value. Um, most, uh, most such sequences of tosses of coins do converge on a value, uh, but uh, there's no general necessity why any series of uh, events should confer, converge on a value. Why do we infer from uh, the series of heads and tails converging on a value, let's say half? What is the structure of that inference? Well, if we've observed 100 tosses, and it's roughly 50% uh, of heads, uh, what we say is, well, the, what, the best explanation of all this is that there is a certain physical probability, a certain bias of a half. And given that, then of course we are going to expect that bias to repeat itself and therefore it will be converged. But this inference is only a valid inference if we suppose that the explanation of the uh, sequence so far, the uh, best explanation of the sequence so far, is in terms of a physical propensity in the thing concerned. But the issue in this case is that the rival hypothesis suggests that it isn't a matter of some already fixed bias. It is an undetermined choice which doesn't have a precise numerical value. It's up to Alice on each occasion how she chooses. And therefore the step from this is the ratio of 100 choices to there must be an underlying cause that makes it this number of choices rather than that number of choices is invalid. And if it's invalid, then you can't infer further. Now, this counter-argument of mine depends on the view that there can be undetermined events which don't have a precise numerical value. The point has been made by, in an article by Lara Buchak in 2013 that um, undeterminism doesn't entail a particular value. Um, and she quotes a Hayek uh, who finds this fact, uh, an example of this fact in one interpretation of quantum theory. Hayek writes, it seems to me that the intuition that chances must always exist, in other words, precise numerical values for physical events, that chances must always exist, even for free acts, parallels the intuition that values for observables, such as position and momentum, must always exist. But the latter intuition has been challenged since Boer and has been hit particularly hard since the 
Culture and Spear Specker Theorem. So what he's suggesting is that one natural interpretation of quantum theory is that the particle has no position until you measure it. That is to say, the measurement gives it a value. Uh, but that doesn't follow from that, that it's deter that it, anything about whether it's determined or not. Well, this analogy may or may not be uh, useful, and it may not be the correct interpretation of quantum theory at all. But um, it is, I think, nevertheless, <laughs> a useful analogy for the case of human choices, because it does begin to give a sense to the idea that there is a place in our description of the world for undetermined events which do not have a particular fixed objective probability of occurring. What Bouchat does not explain is why we should suppose that free choices are like this. My answer is entailed by what I have already written above, that the only forces which act on the agent to influence her choice are her desires, and desires do not have absolute values. A desire only has a strength of greater than, same as, or less than some other desire. And hence, the operation of these influences will not give any precise degree of probability, any precise degree of bias, to the agent making a particular choice. So the agent has scope within the range of the influences to which he is subject to determine that choice. So, in summary, I claim that following the principle of credulity, we are rational to believe that we sometimes have a choice of which of our desires to act upon, and that desires are the only things which influence our, our choice, and that uh, um, it seems to us, and therefore we're right to conclude, that the desires, the strength of those desires, does not always determine how we will choose. Uh, I then went on to argue that uh, in some cases this can be confirmed or disconfirmed by further uh, evidence from our conscious life. And uh, there can be, and I think it's very much open to argument, just what uh, uh, counter evidence there will be or supporting evidence there will be from neuroscience or psychology. But I cannot see any good a priori arguments against this uh, provisional um, conclusion from the basis of our experience, um, except the Van Wagen argument, and I have argued that that doesn't work. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you, uh, Professor Swinburne, for your talk. Um, I am also a defender of libertarian free will, so I uh, agree with you in almost everything you said. But there are two objections I want to present here. <clears throat> the first one is not uh, my objection. Um, there are some people uh, who claim that uh, neuroscience is not only um, able to disprove um, the um, existence of uh, libertarian free will, but they claim that neuroscience in fact already has disproved um, uh, the existence of free will. They refer to some experiments um, done by Benjamin Libet, um, for example, or Haggard or Haynes. And uh, basically they say that uh, you can scan the brain and then uh, can predict what a person will choose to do a few milliseconds afterwards or even a few seconds. And in the case of Haynes, it was claimed also uh, um, up to 10 seconds afterwards. Now, I, I, uh, I, am not, I, not agree, I do not agree with these claims, but I am uh, I'm curious to, to um, hear what you uh, uh, will say to this uh, to this objection, but another objection is my own, um, and um, I am not quite uh, satisfied with your treatment of the van Inwagen um, argument. The premise of this argument <coughs> is that in a free decision between two alternatives, for example, to tell the truth or to lie, 
there is a fixed probability for each of the two um, choices. And um, that's uh, the premise. And the conclusion is that, therefore, the so-called free action uh, must be random, must be a matter of chance, and so it is not really free. Now, you, um, you handle this uh, counter-argument first I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you accept the argument as a valid one, um, and then you, um, um, in order to, to reject the conclusion, you reject the premise. Uh, while I tend to accept the, the premise of the argument, and, um, um, but um, to reject the conclusion. Now, you refer to um, quantum mechanics to, to show that it is possible that um, a, a certain choice has no uh, numerically uh, probability for its occurrence. But, and then uh, you, your, your main argument is that uh, the, our desires cannot be measured. Um, and therefore, the... Um, the premise of the argument is, is not true. But let me explain um, as how, uh, how I see the, this, um, this matter. I think experience show that each of us has a certain moral character, or simply a character, and that our libertarian free decisions are in a certain way bound to our character. So our character does not strictly determine what our acting, but it leaves us a certain degree of freedom. But it inclines us um, to a certain degree to act in a certain manner. So I, and I think that this inclination can be described by, a numerical, by, by numerical probabilities. For example, I suppose that there are some people which are 50% liars. That means they lie every second time on the average. And I, I hope there are also people who are more inclined to the truth, say they are 99% truth tellers. Um, and um, to determine this uh, um, probability, it is not necessary to measure directly the strength of our desires with the ruler or so, but uh, you can simply count the um, cases um, of, of lies in a day and then divide this number by the uh, um, um, instances of, um, of, of possibilities where one could lie or could tell the truth. And then the, the um, number you get is the probability. And I think <clears throat> this uh, probability is nearly fixed. Uh, it's not absolutely fixed. You can change um, a, a little bit and uh, I, I think the 50% liars uh, need not uh, to be 50% liars all their life. They can change a character also. But uh, this character change, if it is done by free will, I think it is possible only to change character very slowly. By repeatedly um, choosing to act in a, in a certain way, we change character. But it is so slow that at every time we can attribute a, a, a probability uh, how we will act. And you might object that this is, it is also possible to, to change character um, immediately, um, but this is very seldom, and if it occurs, then I think there are always uh, external causes for immediate character changes. It's never a free will um, decision. So, for example, if uh, one changes character to the worse, uh, I think the, the cause might be some shocking experience. For example, someone dies and then one loses faith immediately. Or um, um, there are also changes to the better. For example, St. Paul's character changed in one moment. Uh, first he was a persecutor of the church and then uh, immediately he transformed into a defender of Christian faith. But this was not done by free choice. Uh, Paul himself attributed this to, to God's grace. So I think um, that free decisions are always bound to our character in a way that allows to attribute certain numerical fixed uh, values. 
um, probability values, which are either fixed or can, uh, can uh, change only slowly um, and uh, in, the, in the frame of the, of the character. Um, and <clears throat> this being so, I, I think that, that it does not follow that we have, not, that, that we have no uh, free choice, uh, libertarian free choice, because um, now look at the definition of libertarian free choice, the possibility to do otherwise is perfectly um, given if, uh, if we have a, a probability value, numerically fixed, that does not mean that we are not responsible for our lying or that we um, have no influence on what we do. So I, I think I'm, I'm a kind of compatibilist in a modified form. I, I do not hold that freedom is compatible with strict determinism, but I do hold that it's compatible with the determination of certain probabilities, which leave us uh, sufficient freedom uh, of, uh, of choice. So I'm curious to, to hear what you, uh, your response will be to these uh, objections. Uh, very briefly in response, uh, on the first point, I don't think Libet-type experiments show any such thing. Um, uh, the most that they show with regard to free will is that when somebody makes a choice one way rather than another way, there is a prior sufficient condition which is correlated to something like a 60% degree with the subsequent event. That is to say, the proportion of correlations is not very much greater than a half, and there's nothing very surprising in that. Um, uh, uh, but in any case, my paper was designed to uh, to r rule out considerations of uh, new, uh, evidence from neuroscience. Um, on the second point, I partly agree with you. The phrase I used in, in my paper, and perhaps should have expanded more, I agree, uh, as a conclu my conclusion on this matter, was that the agent has scope within the range of influences to which she is subject to determine that choice. So I'm not wishing to deny that more often we will be influenced by the strongest desire because it needs a lot more hard work to, res <laughs> to resist the strongest desire than the weakest desire. But I was wishing to say that there is no precise degree of strength of the strongest desire and therefore we can determine what the uh, value in any sequence of choices will be um, within, it's more likely to be this than that, of course, but we can make a difference to it. That was the point I was making. And of course, in real life, uh, God is not going to wind back the state of the universe to exactly the way it was, but in real life, as you pointed out, our choices on one occasion make a difference to our um, to the strength of our desires on the next occasion. That, that is very crucial with regards to humans. Easier that each time we make a good choice, it's easier to make a good choice next time and conversely. Um, however, in the imaginary thought experiment, um, uh, it is true, and I accept this, that the strongest desire is more likely to win out on more occasions, but there is certainly no particular value of uh, frequency that it will have, um, and uh, it may have a, a very, uh, it may often be the case that for some people the, the weak good desire always does win out. Um, there, there is no guarantee at all. <laughs> I think the state of the universe, including maybe the state of our soul or whatever, is not a well-defined quantity. Because if it was a well-defined quantity, probably one could not deny the existing probabilities. So I would question this premise that it's possible to define the state of the universe at the moment where I make a decision. And to re... Um, uh, sorry, I don't quite establish understand that. I think uh, my fault, I didn't quite catch something. Um, uh, uh, 
I think he was uh, accepting that um, uh, the only influences on us were our desires. He doesn't, I think, if I remember right, talk about that. Uh, and so the, why is the rest of the universe relevant? No, what I mean is um, the rollback argument is based on the premise that the state of myself, my desires of my of everything that's relevant for my decision is well, a well-defined thing that I re can reconstruct or capture numerically or whatever. And I think that premise is wrong. Uh, that, are you suggesting there are other influences on us than our desires? No, it, it's the state of the universe, including my desires, it's nothing that I can really quantify. Um, well, <laughs> I'm prepared to accept that, but I did have a preliminary uh, point in my ar argument uh, that the only thing that can influence our choices is our desires. Everything else influences them through our desires, and, and given that, it uh, uh, doesn't really matter whether uh, the, the rest of the universe is fixed or not. Even if one uh, admits that every uh, choice and action has to be influenced by our, our desires, there seems to be the additional question, couldn't it be that these desires are themselves influenced by some sort of uh, reflection belief? Yeah. Uh, sure, yeah. I, I would say the whole, the whole tradition of ethics, Plato, Stoic, Kant, and also the Thomas Christian would say, okay, uh, to act really morally is to make these desires only some sort of motivating slave to our uh, moral law, to what, what we think is uh, the best to act. And even if you say in your paper that uh, bad is best, what we hold as the best desire or, or the, the, the worst desire, so it seems to be behind these we need to refer to higher might, higher influence, which is, yeah, uh, reason, uh, belief, uh, what is good, the moral law. Uh, the, the Kenshin uh, position or the, the traditional position, Plato and Stoics and Thomas, against this, yes, idea that the strength of desires is decisive. We have to control them. There's no excuse. Uh, I'm using desire, as I defined, as uh, to describe the inclinations we find ourselves with, uh, how, how strongly we uh, feel keen to do the action and so on. Um, and I was relying on the premise of moral internalism that our value beliefs uh, uh, do create the desires. So if we have true value beliefs, we have truly good desires. Um, uh, but of course these desires may be a bit weak. And if your point is uh, we ought to try and cultivate good, uh, the right values, and we ought to try and uh, make ourselves much more sensitive and keen on those right values, then of course I agree with you. Uh, no, but that's not what this is about. This is about when, at the moment of choice, we have a choice between two things about which we have fixed desires, some of them being caused by our value beliefs. Um, if I guess you're right, then you consider desires to be causes of our choices, but not sufficient causes. Yes. Is that correct? Okay, so um, why speak of desires being causes at all? Why can't we say that uh, the single cause, if we want to uh, employ this, this term at all in this context, is the agent, and the desires have some influence on the agent, yeah. but not, there's no causal influence, because anyway, the desires alone, according to, uh, to your view, could not um, cause an action or a choice, if I'm right. Um, a qualification on the last point. I, I wasn't advocating that we always have free will, uh, as I think I said, there are clearly some people who at particular times uh, do describe themselves as Luther allegedly described himself, I can do no other, and uh, 
the psychopaths no doubt are in this situation sometimes so I think sometimes as it were the agent <laughs> is removed from the situation uh, he is a prisoner of his desires but I like to think that isn't the normal situation and in the normal situation our desires influence us in that sense they are indirect uh, causes of our choice uh, but we can resist the strongest one by, by overruling it. But they're there, and if we didn't step in, they would. If we didn't step in, the strongest desire would win automatically. Richard, I, I just wanted to ask whether you were um, amenable to the to the suggestion that free will can come in degrees, um, perhaps as a, a function of our degree or level of awareness of the, of the factors that um, influence our desires or indeed of the clarity of our grasp of what our own desires are and other strength? Is this something that you would are, uh, are friendly to or do you think of it as just all or nothing either? You know, uh, will I, or I not? think that's right. I mean, given that I, sometimes we don't, or some people don't have any at all, uh, some people may have just a little. Sometimes they can, they can make this sort of choice. But uh, um, their strongest desire is almost overwhelming, almost overwhelming for them. And you're sure, by, by, by training, and there's been a bit of literature on this recently, uh, we can develop willpower. And um, uh, that can, is a matter of strengthening the, the free will, by which I understand making it easier for us uh, to uh, cope with most desires, which uh, therefore become less strong, as it were. Uh, so, yes, it can come in degrees. Is that... Uh, could, could I just follow up briefly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I was wanting to focus on, as a function of more cognitive factors, just awareness of desires are, uh, oh. or of the sources of our desires. The thought being, if I don't really understand what's driving me to be motivated to do something, I, I just find myself with this desire, that I don't have quite the capacity to kind of put those considerations to reflection, that sort of thing. You might think that to some degree gives me less kind of rational control over my own behavior. I can, I can still choose whether to act on that desire, but if, I'm, if I have a better grasp on my own uh, motivational structure, then you might think I have a greater degree of overall rational control. Uh, I think that, uh, what you're suggesting is, is really that there's a time element in this. Um, uh, of course, if, the more we know, uh, the easier it is to make a sensible choice. Um, uh, but uh, I don't think that affects the, uh, this argument. What does, uh, it does affect it is the time element. Um, you you t talked of considered choice, and uh, I agree. Um, the choices we make after thinking about it a few minutes or a few hours or whatever are often rather likely to be rather different from the, the spontaneous ones. And... Uh, Typically, uh, the exercise of free will, uh, especially if desire, contrary desires are strong, requires a little time to push ourselves to do the right action. That is right. So I would think the spontaneous uh, reaction is likely to be... Uh, uh, we are likely to capitulate to the strongest desire unless we, we take a bit of time about it. Uh, I accept that, and our decision not to take a bit of time about it is in fact uh, a capitulation to another strong desire, get it over with quick, um, and that is a bad thing. But uh, uh, yes, I think that is the sort of dynamic involved, yes. Okay, thank you for your uh, very interesting talk. I just uh, wanted to ask you, in order to better understand how uh, the experience of libertarian free will would be different from uh, other types of, um, uh, let's say, having an incompatibilist picture or a f uh, strong determinism. So let's imagine three possible worlds in which one we have a libertarian free will, one in which there's uh, some, some type of compatibilism, and there's some third world where there's a strong determinism. So how would our phenomenal experience 
as agents uh, differ in these three cases. And um, if we can't really speak about uh, such a difference, how can we really distinguish between our experience telling us um, which one would be the case, the, the, the libertarian one or the strong determinism or the other cases? Uh, well, it would depend on the another feature of the alternative world, which you have mentioned. The mere fact that the world is an alternative world doesn't guarantee that we will view it as an alternative world. Um, uh, so it, it might be an alternative world in which our experience was exactly the same as in this world, but nevertheless it would be right to uh, interpret the, that experience as an experience of this world, simply in virtue of the principle of credulity. But if it was uh, an equally uh, uh, tr truth-sensitive experience in the alternative world, then we wouldn't have the experience of choosing at all. Uh, we would just be automatically responding to situations. We will find ourselves automatically make. Sorry, there would be something analogous to choice, but it wouldn't be an, an, a, to, to intention. But it wouldn't be a matter of choosing between. There wouldn't be an experience of choosing between all alternative actions. Uh, we would just uh, experience ourselves as initiating certain uh, uh, actions, just as in, not that I know much about psychopaths, but I imagine psychopaths are, or, or total drug addicts, they can't help doing this. Well, it would be like that for all of us in the, the alternative world. That's the difference it would be if we were aware of it. It seems to me that from a biblical viewpoint, there is a difference between doing good and the, the freedom expressed in doing good and sinning. And um, so I wonder how you can accommodate this uh, symmetry. Just take the, the example you gave of Luther. When, Ju when Luther says, I can do no other, I would say this is the highest expression of freedom. So he, the, this is the, the prime example of a free uh, action. And it's the exact opposite of a psychopath. So what? how can we deal with well, this on your uh, account? Well, I don't agree with that. If it was written, of course, one doesn't know uh, much about uh, Luther's internal life, and I know less than most of you, I dare say. Uh, but um, if we are to take his report seriously, um, that um, it simply wasn't an option for him, he was just doing what he uh, automatically felt right to do, uh, then uh, I don't feel that he deserves any particular moral credit for this. Of course, he did a great action. And uh, the, mo the moral credit uh, will belong to his previous actions where he was facing up to conflicts in his religious beliefs and so on. And that's where the moral credit lies, not uh, at the end of the uh, end of the story, where he makes the the big decision. But if the big decision really is an inevitable one, then I don't think that is the sort of thing for which he deserves moral credit. Though, of course, it's great that he did it, and he deserves some other sort of credit, but not the sort of credit that, that um, we get for making choices one way or the other. That's my reaction. Uh, you said that um, desires influence our actions, but do not also our beliefs influence our actions and not only in the sense that we would have <laughs> that we would have um, different desires if we had different beliefs but sometimes also in the sense that whether we have a certain belief or do not makes all the difference whether we do an action or do it not of course uh, but my point was our beliefs uh, influence our action by creating desires well, I just said that also a belief make all, may make all the Give difference. Me an example. Well, um, I am thirsty. I have a certain des desire, and I, I want to get something to drink. Okay. And um, then, where I go to the left or to the right is where I expect 
say, a refrigerator. It makes all the difference for me. Whether I have the belief that on the right there's a refrigerator where I can get a Coke or something. Yeah, uh, but the difference it makes is that you now desire to go to the right. That, deter that is the final determinant of your choice. I, it's because of certain factual beliefs, I quite agree, as well as of certain value beliefs, altogether they determine the desire to do the immediate action. And in this case, it, that is determining your action to go to the right rather than to the left. Yeah, it was still not a good example, but... <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's really something to, to think about, whether with, with more ingenuity we can think up ca cases where the belief makes all the difference. Well, and I, I leave it to you also. Okay, okay, oh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wehinger is next. Thank you. Uh, so this is just a follow-up to uh, Alin's question. You were speaking about non-free actions, and I was wondering, um, would you say that non-free actions are event-caused or agent-caused? They are agent-caused. Uh, they are caused by the agent, but the difference is <laughs> that uh, the agent has no choice. Um, I should say in this connection that I think all uh, causation is agent-causation. That is to say, um, uh, <laughs> it's not the case that the present position of the sun uh, causes the motion of the earth. It is that the sun causes the motion of the earth uh, in virtue of its present position. But the, uh, and the difference between the two sorts of causation is that uh, intentional causation, as I would call it, is in, uh, causation by an agent in virtue of their uh, intention to bring about uh, this event, and non, uh, what is normally called event causation, is really agent causation by the substances involved in virtue of their um, dispositions to exercise certain powers and their liability to exercise them in certain situations so that the sun has the power to cause the earth to move and the liability to exercise that power when the earth is in a certain situation relative to the sun. I think that brings the two sorts of causation much closer together than if we suppose there are really two sorts of causation, which seems to be... Multi it seems very strange that there should be one sort of process by which I affect my brain and quite different sort of processes by which my brain affects my limbs. So that, that's uh, rather by the way, but anyway, that's it. You mentioned uh, the possibility of training your, yeah. um, your willpower to increase yeah. the freedom of choice. And this reminded me on a... Uh, Ignatian praxis in his exercises, which goes the opposite strategy, where he says you should f uh, uh, handle with your desires in a way that you reach a status of gleichgültigkeit. Um, uh, um, what's that? Um, indifference. Indifference against your desires to increase the freedom of your choice uh, to be well to let you determined by your by your reasons and beliefs how would you command on that on the background of well, your it idea? depends how the word desire is being used i was using the word desire as an inclination to do a certain sort of action and um uh, Ignatius is not advising us not to cultivate inclinations to do certain sort of actions. What he is recommending to us is not to be influenced by uh, desires which have nothing to do with values. Okay. Um, you know, a desire to eat uh, which has nothing to do with uh, the goodness of eating and so on. Sure. Thank you for the presentation. I just want to ask if our desires... Um determine our decisions. Uh, would you agree with uh, what some of the theologians tell us that we, uh, our, responsi our responsibility is then uh, to strengthen and feed our desires in order to be, um, to feed them with the right things, let's say, in order to be prepared for the right choices? 
And also uh, in the examples that we, we discussed, the desire of doing the right things isn't somehow different uh, by the desire, uh, from the desires of doing all the other things, let's say. Uh, well, I is that, it, so, isn't that difference? I just take the first one first yes. and then come back because I don't quite follow the second one. Um, yes, uh, uh, progress, moral progress, spiritual progress is certainly a matter of strengthening our good desires and suppressing um, our bad desires. Yes, sure, but that, that takes time and of course my paper was concerned with our responsibility for the moment of choice. Now, I'm sorry, if you could repeat the second question. Uh, it seems to me that the desire of doing good, it's completely different from the desire of some other desires that we have in our heart. Yes, uh, but um, sure, uh, I agree. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, the, de the desire to do good uh, by itself uh, has no effect. It, it just it has to be combined with uh, uh, a belief that a certain action is a good action. And that is, as it were, the resulting desire which influences us to do that action. But it influences us because of our belief that it is a good desire. Yeah.